Thank you. Are you hearing me, everyone? Thank you for inviting me here. I'm very honored to be here. Uh, the subject of my presentation is testing in the age of distraction. And to be honest, it's a subject that has kept me busy for quite some time. Actually, way longer than I had anticipated because I'm, I'm quite easily distracted and I'm a big procrastinator, which means I tend to postpone stuff all the time. So while preparing a presentation about distraction, I was constantly distracted. So in a, in a sense, it will be quite a meta presentation. Um, just to give this to you. Distraction has a bad name nowadays. It's seen by many people as the ultimate enemy of getting things done. And I agree on some, to some respect, but I think distraction is also misunderstood. Because it has worked against me many times in my life, sure. But it also worked for me many times. For instance, when I was studying in college, I was surprised to find that unlike many of my fellow students, when I was studying, I didn't need total isolation or silence. I was able to study better with a TV in my line of sight. I wasn't really watching the TV, but just the TV there, uh, the radio was playing, I wasn't really listening. But if I didn't have these distractions in the background, I just wasn't able to keep focused. And if you think that's strange, you should talk to my parents. It drove them crazy. Uh, but this triggered me a little bit to investigate the phenomenon. I said, how is that possible? And so it became quite a personal journey. I set out to learn about distraction, but I also learned a lot about myself. So here goes. Imagine that there's a bank that every morning deposits 86,400 zlotys into your account. Imagine winning the testing cup twice every day. Uh, or make it, maybe make it euros, which make it, makes it a better deal, right? 86,400 euros. And the only catch is, it's there in the morning and it's gone in the evening. So you cannot save any of it up. You have to use it carefully. Would you think carefully about how you'd use it each day? The thing is, we all have this account available to us, except it's, it's not money, it's, it's time, it's seconds. Every day we have 86,400 seconds in a day. They're there in the morning, they're gone in the evening. And you cannot save any of them up. So that's, does that stress you out? Do you know that? Does that make you think of living differently? Can you feel the seconds blip away? Because they're blipping away at this very moment. And the thing is, we cannot save any of these seconds up, but what we can do is, is use them wisely. And with wisely, I, I'm not necessarily talking about using, being productive all of the time, because that, that's simply not possible. But what you can do is use the time in such a way that to accomplish the things that really matter to you, get the things done that really matter to you. Uh, you want to be happy, you want to be good parents, good friends, good partners. And on top of that, you want to excel professionally. Like you want to become better testers, better managers, better coaches. I guess you're all here at the Testing Cup for a reason. You're all here, want to, yeah, you want to become better at what you do. But all of that isn't easy because we live in curious times. It's, we live in the age of information, people call it, but you might as well call it the age of distraction. When we're at work, well, distractions, let's hold my horses, distractions, uh, this is not, well, distractions have been there many ages, but never have they been so overpowering and so overwhelming as they're now. When we're at work, uh, distractions are coming at us from every direction. In front of us, there's a computer with email and other notifications, and then there's the addicting lure of the browser, which is nothing less than a, than a black hole from which we can never escape, uh, but it does offer us unlimited opportunities for chatting and shopping and lolcat pictures. And then uh, several email com emails come in at the same time, and then that's just in front of us. And the program under test is also in front of us. And then from the side come a ringing desk phone, a ringing mobile phone, uh, other devices, people coming to ask a question, someone offering a freshly baked cake, someone, if you're lucky, someone coming to ask a question. And it doesn't stop there when you're driving home. You get bombarded with advertisements in the car, and uh, they're not asking only for your attention, but also your desires. And then you pull up on the driveway at home. And then there's the TVs, the computers, your kids, your spouses, assuming you only have one spouse, I guess. I don't know how it is in Poland. I guess it's the same in Belgium. Um, but with so many things competing for our attention, it's a wonder we can get anything done at all, really. And some people, they claim they have found uh, the solution. And they say it's called multitasking. <laughs>
it's time for a phone to save us from our phones. New Windows Phone, designed to get you in and out and back to life. I wanted to play it until the very end because to give Microsoft credit for a great commercial, although I'm, I'm an Apple fan. But <laughs> you got to give people credit when it's really good, right? So multitasking, really? The trouble with that is that studies over the last 20 years have shown over and over again that multitasking is, is really a myth. When you think you're multitasking, doing several things at once, you're almost always serial tasking, switching rapidly between tasks. Um, you're not driving on the information superhighway, you're stepping on the gas and hitting the brakes over and over again. So you're living in a state of continuous partial attention. And maybe a, little, a first little poll of the audience, who of you, when you're driving and you're kind of looking for directions or when you're lost, who of you mute your car stereo when you're looking for directions? Okay. You don't have to be ashamed. I do that as well, and I found it strange, but actually, it's, apparently, it's not very strange. It's because the amount of attention that we have is strictly limited. It's a zero-sum game. If we direct most of our attention to listening to something, the other things that we were doing have to suffer. So the driving has to suffer, so it's not very safe that way. Um, actually, you can multitask. There's some ways you can multitask, but there's some conditions that need to be fulfilled. For instance, the, the tasks, they uh, need to be, maybe one of the tasks is so well learned, it's always automatic, almost automatic, like walking or eating. And the tasks, they need to operate on several, on different channels. For instance, uh, folding the laundry, which is a visual, visual manual task, while listening to something, uh, while listening to a test report, for instance, which is not something I do very often. But you're able to multitask like that. So this is the model uh, of this presentation. This is what I'm going to talk about uh, today. And it's not, it's something that I made up uh, just to understand the material better and to get a grasp of it. And it's not scientific at all. Uh, you see there's a squirrel uh, in there, so usually it's not very scientific uh, when you see that. Uh, but okay, I'll mention, uh, talk about distractions and uh, the kinds of distractions that are there. I talk about uh, Defocusing, well, using distractions as a way to focus, which is kind of paradoxical. Uh, distractions as a way to defocus as well. Talk about procrastination a little bit, about flow, and about what it means for testing. So, on we go. So, distractions are all around us. But why is that such a problem? Can we just uh, decide to ignore them? Apparently, it's not as simple as that, because there's two types of... There's human factors and context factors that lead us to be terminally distracted. And I'm pointing uh, at a couple of human factors first. First, humans are biologically wired to be distracted. When our ancestors were out hunting, and the bush next to them rustled, the ones that didn't look up to see the saber-toothed tiger coming at them, they're probably not our ancestors. So we needed to be distractible in order to survive. And it's still uh, inside our bodies like that. Also, humans are daydream, a daydreaming species. Studies by Harvard, I think, Harvard, have shown that humans uh, daydream 47% of the time they're awake. 47% uh, of the time, that's half of the time. And apparently, the only activity during which people were not uh, distracted or daydreaming was lovemaking. Apparently, we were able to focus on that. Just giving it as a, a bit of information. Also, a human factor is something called decision fatigue, because we make a lot of decisions during the course of a day. But you cannot make decision after decision after decision without paying a biological price. And it's not the same as uh, ordinary physical fatigue. You're not consciously aware of getting tired, but you become low on mental energy, which eats the each decision, decision that you take, the harder each one becomes for your brain, and eventually your brain starts looking for shortcuts and it gets harder to resist urges, and you start behaving recklessly. Resisting urges like eating the contents of your fridge, or checking your Facebook and email while you're doing something else. So that's also the reason why they put candy at the, at the counters in supermarkets. By the time people get to the exit, they lost all their resistance because of all the decisions people had to take in the aisles, like which kind of cereal do I buy, which kind of apples do I buy. All these small decisions, they have a, place a toll on your brain. Also, 
some of these distractions are really addictive. Do you know which is the, the most profitable part of a casino? Do you have any idea what that is? It's uh, the slot machines, the ones that pull with the three things that have to be in line and you win the jackpot. And it's because they use a principle called variable ratio schedule, random payout. So if, you're gonna, if you pull that handle and it pays you the same amount every hundred times or so, you quickly stop playing. But if you pull that handle and it pays you a little bit sometimes and sometimes nothing and other times potentially a lot, you're going to keep on playing. And if you look at messages like uh, email messages or Facebook messages in that respect, it's the same thing. Uh, sometimes it's nothing. Sometimes it's really, really funny. Sometimes it's very urgent. So it's random payout in our pockets. So these were internal human factors. And there's one big external factor that has an influence as well on us being constantly distracted. And it's kind of illustrated by this graph by the fantastic Jessica Hagi. I don't know if you heard about her. She has a site called This Is Indexed where she draws little, um, little scenes and little very s smart things. And it says here, okay, being informed is, is, is kind of good and nice. The more information you have, the less confused you are. But if these, the information coming at us rises and rises and rises, we just become more confused instead. This is also known as information overload, a term coined by Alvin Toffler in his 1970 book, Future Shock. And it's about, it's information overload is about the difficulties that people have understanding things and because simply the presence of too much information. And I mentioned this being uh, an external factor, but you might as well see this as a hidden internal factor because you might, well, maybe we shouldn't be blaming the information that's out there. Maybe we, it's our filters that are broken. Maybe we're not able to cope with all the information and we're not able to filter it out. So it's not information overload, it's filter failure. Okay. So we can roughly divide distractions in two categories. Deceptive and receptive distractions. Receptive distractions are the ones that create mental space and make you feel relaxed after a while and, and in the longer term they help you to regain focus again. And it can be as simple as having a walk outside or having a glass of iced tea of some kind. And then, oh, and then there's the deceptive distractions. These are any distractions that make you lose track of what you are working on and cause you to get immersed in all kinds of other issues. The biggest one in here is M&Ms, if you know what, I mean, what that means. Yes, managers and meetings, indeed. Uh, emails, phone calls, the internet in general, games, lots of gamers here. Um, also, in general, you could say that the likelihood of uh, distraction being receptive is tied to the fact whether it engages a different skill set of the thing you're working on. For instance, if you're reading, reading and writing code, and then you switch to reading and writing blog posts, it's almost, it's a bit too similar. It's not really... Um, receptive then, it's rather more uh, deceptive. And uh, deceptive distractions are the ones that cause us to procrastinate on stuff and to start doing postponing stuff. And I'm going to talk about procrastination a little bit now. Procrastination meaning postponing stuff, putting things off until an undefined future date. I don't know if this looks familiar to any of you. Uh, it does to me. In the face of a deadline, we all of a sudden become super productive and, and we work an all-nighter or maybe late at night and then we pull it off and we say, yes, I did it again. And then you're quite proud, but then in the end you're, you're feeling drained and you say, I'm not, I don't think if I will be able to do this again later on. So it's, it's kind of, it works, but it's not really something that you can repeat too much. And this is also a distraction at work, uh, procrastination at work. Um, Faced with a daunting task, everything else becomes super appealing. Uh, yes, I, I want to do that, but I have to clean my desk first, and I have to write this piece, but I cannot really write the piece uh, if I haven't sharpened my pencils first. And yes, honey, I'll do that, but I have to mow the lawn first. So, and you can see there's a lot of misconceptions about procrastination. People think it's plain laziness. This is a pie chart of procrastination. People say, uh, usually think it's plain laziness, not accomplishing anything. But actually, you're accomplishing quite a lot of things. You're doing lots of stuff, just not the stuff that you're supposed to be doing at that moment. So, if you think about that way, you can accomplish a lot of things while procrastinating. 
I also want to mention that there's a thin line between procrastination and defocus, and I will be talking about defocusing later, and I drew it as a thin line, which I thought was a smart thing to do. Uh, so it's a thin line because uh, a lot of our procrastination leads to learning. Not always uh, learning you need at the moment, but possibly uh, useful later on. Lots of our learning is a side effect. You learn things, you see things, you read things, and you might be using that a little bit later on. Um, this was also a quote in uh, Secrets of a Buccaneer Scholar by James Bach. Okay, so regaining focus. I mentioned in the beginning that I was kind of struggling while I was creating this presentation. I was kind of uh, looking at ways to, to start focusing better, actually. And at one point I was desperate enough to join a Facebook productivity group, which is kind of a strange thing if you think about it. But I uh, actually saw some good tips there. They, uh, there were a couple of suggestions that you start taking notes of the, your procrastination behavior. Start taking notes and you see patterns emerge and see when and why you procrastinate. And it's kind of, it was kind of interesting to see. And then in full procrastination mode, I read a book called The Now Habit by Neil Fiore. It was about, well, I saw somewhere, uh, saw it as a tip somewhere about procrastination. It's, and it's dealing more with the psychological side of procrastination. Actually, why people procrastinate, why people do that. Um, and the author, Neil Fiore, offers a couple of tips in there that you could try, and I decided, okay, as part of an experiment for this presentation, I want to try these things. And there's a couple of techniques that I started using and that I found really helpful. I want to share them with you. Uh, first one is the reverse calendar, and second one is the unschedule. Reverse calendar is actually uh, quite a simple thing. It's, a, it's kind of a reverse schedule of the task ahead. You start with the thing you want to accomplish, the thing you need to do, and then, listing it backwards in time, chronologically backwards, you list all the things that you need to do, accomplish. And what it does is it forces you to, to split this big daunting task into smaller, more achievable chunks of work. And listing it in reverse helps you to keep the end goal in mind. And this was, for instance, this was just an example of, uh, I had to prepare the presentation for Let's Test, which is a conference in Sweden. And I listed all the, like the, all the, the dates, all the, the deadlines I had to meet for myself, and I, it eased my mind a great deal to see, oh, there's plenty of time left, so it, it helped me in that respect. Second one is the unschedule. And this is very peculiar. This is kind of a weak schedule, but with a twist. Instead of planning, which usually people are doing, instead of planning all the things that you have to do first, you first make sure you plan all the things that you want to do. Uh, for instance, you make time, you plan, the, these are the things in blue that I planned in the calendar. Um, you plan all the, the social activities, you plan your, maybe your work route, your, your uh, workouts, or you go running or whatever, or you plan some social things in the evening, uh, some reading time, some TV time. Of course, during the day there's work time, which is filled by work, but all the other open slots I was filling up first, and then I noticed, okay, to work on my presentation, there's like these two white slots left this week. And it changes your mindset a little bit from, I need to work on my presentation or on whatever you're doing for at least 10 hours or something. Now you see, oh, I've only four hours this week. So it actually makes you more focused when you start doing it, makes you more focused to do the work. Uh, it also worked quite nicely out for me. So this was uh, procrastination. Now I'm going to focus on uh, focus, so to speak. Distractions in support of focus. That sounds like produ paradoxical. Weren't distractions the enemy of focus? Well, if you remember the thing I mentioned in the beginning, that I was able to study better with the, the TV on and the radio on, and I stumbled upon some pretty interesting scientific research that might explain what was going on here. First one was a study uh, by the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience, and probably it's a well-known um, thing for testers, I don't know if you've heard about inattentional blindness, the fact that when you're focusing intently on one thing, you miss other things that might be in plain sight because you're just you're focusing really on something very specific, you miss all the rest. Well, they found here uh, a way to use that inattentional blindness to your advantage. They said they found that if you uh, actually uh, bring your brain under a high information load, really bombard it with information, that your processing becomes selective and you're able to process, you filter out irrelevant distractions better. So I think that was what I was doing. I was bombarding myself with irrelevant stuff and I was able to focus better on the task, which is 
quite a paradoxical finding, if you think about it. And then there was another one, a study by, uh, it was the Carnegie Mellon uh, University, and they found that, well, the brain regions that are responsible for making decisions or for solving problems, they continue to be active even when your brain is distracted by another activity. So if you're trying to solve some problem or a puzzle and you're distracted and you start doing something else, your brain in the background keeps working on that first problem without you knowing it. So the, the fascinating thing was that the people weren't aware that they were still solving problem, uh, fr a problem from before. That's quite interesting and I talk about unconscious processing later on. So, focusing. Well, um, when you get distracted, there's a lot of, if we're doing logical work and logical reasoning, if you get distracted, it can be quite bad because it's kind of, you have this working uh, directory in your head, you're working and you dump a working stack, and if you get distracted, it gets dumped, and it could take, can take up to half an hour to get it back up again. So, um, here are a couple of tips and tricks, things that I use to, uh, that improve my ability to focus, so to speak. So, the first one would be, okay, just disconnect from the internet. And if you're gonna do that, or um, just don't go posting stuff right before you disconnect. Don't go post stuff on Twitter or Facebook or whatever. Own experience, you wanna keep on checking all the stuff, so. Uh, but usually for your work, you need the internet, so you cannot just shut it off. In that case, you might wanna just shut down the things that distract you. And if you don't trust yourself to do that, there's a nice tool actually that, that can do it for you. It's called uh, self-control for the Mac, I can show you. It's, it's really simple, you just specify, um, just you can indicate how long it's going to take and then you have a blacklist of things that you put in there. So you see, uh, I added a couple of these things that I was constantly uh, procrastinating on. The Witcher, I'm not going to look at your site any longer. Um, too distracting. Okay. So stay focused is a Chrome extension that basically does the same thing. You specify something that you cannot access for a given period of time, and it works wonders. You also might want to look into uh, using multiple desktops. Uh, on Windows, for instance, you can use that uh, with a program called VirtualWin, and you can have the, the program under test on one desktop and like quarantine all the distractions on another one. That's a possibility. Or you could uh, use on the Mac, you have a, a built-in functionality called spaces that you could use. Uh, it's something, it's quite, I didn't actually know before I heard someone mention, oh, it's not this one, before I heard someone mention it, just you can add new desktops here, like that. I didn't know that, so, quite interesting. Okay. Also, uh, you might want to cut down on notifications, because uh, we develop the need to respond to many things, making our days responsive rather than driven by conscious choices. Uh, but the truth is you don't need to respond. You can decide when you respond. So make your personal mantra, you don't need to respond, and recite that in your head, you don't need to respond. You just, you don't need to respond. Helps as well. This is something that worked wonders for me. Um, the 10 plus 2 times 5 procrastination act. I don't know how it's pronounced, but I say the 10 plus 2 times 5. And it's a, basically a quite simple technique or, or trick. It's working in a time-boxed uh, way. Ten minutes of, well, ten minutes of single-minded focus, very focused work, and then two minutes of break. You time your time, uh, you time box it. Two minutes in which you can do whatever you, you like. You can serve the internet, you can go outside, for, but it's only two minutes, so it's very short. And then you repeat that a couple of times, so you fill an hour. And it's not unique, uh, there's the Pomodoro technique, for instance, it's something that does the same thing. It's all based on time boxes and regular breaks. And I used this uh, intensively when I was um, heading the, the Eurostar, uh, assembling Eurostar program, and we had to work our way through a lot of submissions, like 400 plus, uh, and they all looked alike, and you had to read the abstracts and score them or whatever, rank them in a way, and all of, after 50, it all started looking alike and sounding alike. And then I decided to start using this to see what it would help. And I think it kind of doubled or tripled my productivity. It kind of, uh, but the thing is, and I think Shmuel could have used this uh, this year with his even more submissions for Eurostar. Um, I don't know if you have. Have you, have you done something like that? Yeah, this one? 
Okay. Did it work? Well, <laughs> well okay. Um, but the thing is, it works well for easily dividable logical tasks, things that you can like easily cut in, into blocks, but it doesn't work well for more creative work. It's just not fit for that. And this is a little video to, to illustrate that. First time I saw this, uh, I found it uh, moving to see. I don't know if it has the same effect on you. I, but still, when I see it, it's kind of, uh, and it makes a good point. Uh, for creative work, you need let the creativity come out. You cannot just time box all the stuff. It's it's not that's not working like that. Uh, if you couple that to testing and relate that to testing, um, you cannot really use that Pomodoro thing on testing with just two short time boxes. It does not work like this. Uh, it's kind of creative thinking work, so creativity needs time to unfold in unpredictable ways. When testing, for instance, you do, you can work in time boxes, and a technique that I use regularly when I'm doing exploratory testing is uh, session-based testing. Like, you work in a session, a time box, you have kind of, uh, the purpose of your session is a charter, which mentions, okay, this is what I'm going to do in this session, and you start testing, and these are a couple of, of things that I do to keep focus when I'm in such a session. So I block time up front. People know when I'm going to be in a test session. You can use a visual indicator that you're testing, actually. Uh, put something on top of your computer, for instance, that people see, OK, when it's there, he's, don't bother him unless the building's on fire, for instance, or something else. Or uh, if someone offering a freshly baked cake, you might interrupt him. But for the rest, block your time and uh, make sure you can do the work. Then uh, have everything when you... Uh, go do your testing, have everything set up up front, like open all the tools, uh, things that you're going to use during your testing, like spreadsheets, bug tracking tools, uh, Excel, the application itself, have it ready and open so you don't have to switch and start looking for startup things and whatever. So it it's, uh, helps you to focus better. Also, group certain features together to avoid context switching. And also, if you find defects or have questions during your session, you might want to just take note of it and continue and address them later. Uh, you can start logging your defects immediately, but then you get distracted by that and you, you lose track of what you're working on. So this is something the way I uh, do it uh, normally. Also, this is the last uh, kind of uh, tip for focusing. And this is something I borrowed from Jerry Weinberg. And it's a, something uh, simply called a do not do list. And it's a quite simple thing. Uh, at the start of every month, you sit down and you list the things on your mind that you're not going to 
worry about that month. So it's just, okay, I'm not going to worry about this and this. And it's a real time saver, actually. So remember, everything not worth doing is not worth doing right. You don't have to spend time on that. So you can eliminate a couple of things already for a, a month or so. If you're speaking about focus, uh, I also want to talk about flow. So have you ever been in this kind of state uh, that you were kind of in a zone so involved uh, with an activity that nothing else seemed to matter anymore? Like you lost all sense of time? It's, it's a, something called flow and it, it, it was coined by Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, I think it was pronounced, it's a Hungarian psychologist. And he coined the term flow, he said, okay, this is something, the, the ultimate state of being focused, it's the Valhalla of focus, you can reach that. And Csikszentmihalyi said, you can reach that, but there's uh, three conditions that need to be fulfilled to, to be able to achieve that kind of state of bliss and to state of being very focused. And he said, these three things, you have to have, if you're working on something, it has to be an activity with a clear set of goals and progress. Also, it has to be an activity, the thing that you're doing, there has to be clear and immediate feedback. You have to know at each point how you're doing. And there has to be a good balance between the perceived difficulty of the task and your perceived ability to do it. It's all, it all boils down to having the confidence that you'll be able to do the task. So if you have good confidence in yourself, you will be able to achieve that. So I'd like to think about it for a minute and see how we could try to reach this kind of state as testers. Uh, clear set of goals and progress. Well, I was talking about having sessions like uh, time boxes, charters, a clear mission for your testing, know what you're doing, know what your focus is in that session, it helps. Uh, that could be something you could do to try to achieve that flow. Also, clear and immediate feedback. When you're testing in an exploratory fashion, it's by definition, you're working with very fast feedback. It's kind of one of the characteristics of exploratory testing is you design experiments in your head, you try them, and you immediately see whether the thing that you thought of is correct or not. So you have quick feedback about the things that you're doing. And if you look at the graph there, which maps the skills um, and the complexity, the higher your skills, the higher the chance of achieving flow. So if you work on your skills, try to become better, what you do, you might achieve that kind of state. But still, there's also a paradox in here for testers. Because also, Csikszentmihalyi said, in order to achieve flow, you must be willing to suspend your critical abilities for a while. But what happens when testers suspend their critical abilities? Well, I think you start missing things. So that's kind of... And also, beware of the opiate of expertise, because it ca can feel really fuzzy and warm to do something that you're good at. And you get the confirmation, damn, I'm good at this. But sometimes to advance and to progress, you have to step outside that warm, fuzzy cocoon of comfort, outside the comfort zone. Uh, because, yeah, comfort zone is, is nice, but nothing new ever grows there. So. Uh, you might want to step outside. So that was flow. Now I want to focus on how distractions can help us enhance our creativity. And I want to do a second poll. And you can yell, just yell out loud, um, where do you get your best ideas? Don't be uh, shy. In the toilet, that's what I meant, don't be shy. <laughs> a lot of people get good ideas on the toilet. A shower? I heard shower. Hmm? In the kitchen? While you're cooking? Or while you're doing the dishes? Or while you're eating, maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, what you notice throughout, and I can disclose my, the places where I get my best ideas are, uh, well, places, while, I, while I'm running and while I'm driving in the car, while I'm commuting. There's something about, I think, the, the monotonous like sounds, and, and all of a sudden, my mind goes off and I start like uh, getting great ideas. Um, the thing is, great ideas don't occur to us while we're focused on, on tasks or doing tasks. They happen when our minds start wandering. You could say mind wandering promotes creativity. It's like, it's a perfect condition for creative thought. It goes all directions. Um, also, studies have shown that daydreaming is kind of the equivalent of night dreaming, like to uh, facilitate bursts of creative insight. It actually has a purpose. Um, also, and I don't know if you've heard about Steven Johnson, who has a, a, one of the most popular TED Talks, where good ideas come from. 
he also, it's also a book, I think. The book was first, and then he did a TED talk about it. And he mentioned that uh, great ideas uh, occur when people combine their hunch, their idea, with someone else's idea. And in order to do that, you have to place yourself in an environment that fosters good collaboration. You have to be meeting people to exchange ideas. And he said, historically, he saw that happen when uh, coffee shops, not the, the weed smoking coffee shops, but uh, coffee houses, uh, rather, um, came into existence and uh, scientists would start meeting there to discuss ideas. And he said, a lot of scientific advances really took a, a high jump once they started doing that because ideas would flow and new theories and would happen. And okay, nowadays, while the internet can be a source of distraction, it can also be a fantastic collaborative environment. I'm just mentioning well, social media. One of I'm just mentioning one of one of it. The thing that I use a lot is well, I start using it less and less now, but I've used it a lot. as Twitter, for instance, when you're at conferences, it helps you to to uh, virtual atten virtually attend events, not only conferences, but things. You can mingle in discussions that happen. Um, it's kind of you can participate while not being there, and people will be in an audience uh, quoting, like uh, stating little quotes from the presentation, doing uh, real-time comments on the presentation, that kind of stuff. You can use Twitter as a sounding board. If you write articles, blog posts, uh, you don't even need to have many followers. If you just use the, the right hashtag, for instance, uh, software testing or testing, it will be picked up. And if, people, if it resonates with people, they will react to it. And if you ask for help, uh, the society, the, the community, the testing community is, is really helpful, I found, and uh, if you ask for help, help will appear if you actually ask for it. And also it helps facilitate connection in real life. When you've interacted with people on Twitter and all of a sudden you meet them at a conference or somewhere else, it seems as if you know each other already for a long time. It's kind of strange um, that I'm in a collective called DUDE. It's a Dutch exploratory workshop on testing. Uh, we get together every couple of months and then we discuss testing and we organize little conferences. But I actually met all these guys online on Twitter, kind of centered and the discussion was going, ah, oh, we should meet up, uh, we're all really close by one another. So, and then it kind of came into existence just because of that. So that's a group. Also, you can use Twitter to help your testing, for instance. And I got the idea from Pradeep Sandararajan, which is an, uh, an Indian tester turned entrepreneur nowadays, but he, he demonstrated a, a technique called um, Twitter-driven exploratory testing, while he was actually using Twitter to uh, evaluate how users see your product. And he was using it on the I IRCTC, which is an Indian railroad company, and he used that hashtag, and he combined it with negative emoticons, or the hashtag fail, or hashtag four-letter words, English, I'm not going to say it out loud. And, if, and he tried it in a live demo, and out came this endless stream of complaints and people, oh, uh, I'm not able to pay and my, my bill, the, the, the payment module is stuck and I'm not receiving my tickets and the printing doesn't work. It was like uh, one test idea after another and things that, like, like user experience uh, comments like that. And also sat down and tried it on uh, The Witcher. Uh, I'm not going to do it live now, but if you do The Witcher and then fail, for instance, there will be people saying, oh, yeah, glitches here and there. So. I'm sure maybe the people that work there have used that channel to see how uh, it's happening with every game, of course. And there's also, like, hashtag win also gives hits, of course. That's uh, not only fail, but you can use it that way in your testing. If you uh, hear this, this is, this is called ambient noise. It's, it's kind of the noise that you have in uh, uh, coffee houses, coffee shops. Um, and so these have found that low to moderate levels of this kind of noise enhance creativity, enhance, if you're doing creative work, it actually helps you, while high level noise of this kind hinders you, which is kind of logical, but actually it, it helps you to, to be more creative. So that's why you can do so, so much good work in coffee shops. Well, if you're sitting there, it's kind of a very relaxed kind of feeling. Um, for the people that don't have the luxury of going to work in coffee shops, there's even online. You can find covetivity.com. And it's actually uh, a site that you can plug and then it plays this sound um, permanently. So you can, there's a lot of sites that use noises and nature noises, of course, and that kind of stuff. But this is ambient noise from like, it works quite well. 
and it's it's great for agoraphobes. You don't have to leave the house, so you don't have to be afraid of open spaces. So, okay, mentioning defocusing. Defocusing is a natural uh, reflex for us, uh, but still a lot of people look down upon defocusing, thinking that uh, you can only do creative, like you can only do focused work when you actually focus on something. You can only be very productive if you're really working on something. But if you look at professional athletes and their training schedules, you'll notice that uh, days of rest are specifically planned in their schedule. And it's kind of logical because they're in a physical line of work and they need these days of rest to to let their muscles recuperate and to, uh, well, to come out stronger. But is it such a crazy idea that we as uh, knowledge workers or people that do thinking a lot during our work, is it such a crazy idea that we also take breaks to rejuvenate our thinking and to let our brains recuperate? Also for solving complex problems, people think, okay, sleep on it and, and focus. Um, and uh, because that means to actually be working on something. If, you, if you're looking at it intently and very focused, that's the only way you can solve complex problems. But the truth is that if you want to solve complex problems with creativity, you have to be in a kind of a defocused setting. Your mind works better when it's defocused. And there's a, a big lesson here that I learned uh, the hard way. Uh, knowledge work doesn't always look like work. Um, it's very, sometimes very hard to spot um, that someone is working when he's doing something else. And I learned that, I said, the hard way when I was at the customer site. And there was this one guy constantly, like 10, 15 times a day, going outside with a cigarette and a coffee. And he was constantly standing in the hallway, well, just outside the hallway, smoking and drinking coffee. And I was kind of, uh, I made a smug remark and said, that this is probably not the next employee of the month, right? And then he said, no, 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 you misunderstand. He's the creative mastermind of the whole project. Uh, he needs this kind of time, he, he, that's where he does his thinking. And I kind of, okay, uh, I was not really aware of that, and that's, that made me think uh, differently about that kind of situation. So, knowledge work doesn't always look like work. Here's a couple of tips and tricks to help you defocus. One of them is, well, I would say follow your energy. Uh, sometimes it's good to let yourself be distracted. It's then that your mind starts making connections. And James Bach calls it, uh, follow your energy, heuristic. He says, let it drift off, but if you want to be really productive as well, you can combine it with something called the long leash heuristic. Act as if your, your mind is on a leash, like you're walking a dog, it's on a leash. Let your mind drift off, but then gently pull the leash to regain focus again. Be aware that you're drifting off and keep it on a leash. That's what he said. And then there's the get a coffee heuristic, which I proudly coined myself in 2013. It's not picked up yet by the mainstream media, but um, I'm continuing to push it and, and plug it. Uh, because it, in the program, uh, the product I'm still testing, actually, at the moment, um, I came across crashes that were really hard to reproduce. I was really struggling with it. And after a while, it dawned on me that, well, apparently they seem to appear uh, more uh, frequently after uh, lunch breaks and after long breaks. And apparently it turned out that the, the bugs, the crashes were uh, timing related and not tied to anything done in the GUI. So, uh, but I only found out after taking long breaks. So that's when I coined, well, get, go get a coffee. It works well, wonders for timing related bugs, but also for bug finding in general. Um, fresh eyes find failure. And I'm sure probably many of you have seen bugs staring you in the face after you came back from a break while you've been testing a couple of hours before. So, and I've also heard in the translations about the talk, the talk of yesterday about the Witcher, that new people were brought in, was that correct? That they have a fresh view on things, that they see things that all the other people don't see anymore because they're too involved. That's the same thing. Fresh eyes, fresh eyes find failure. It's, uh, it's kind of a good thing. Also, I would say to sharpen your note-taking skills. Be uh, prepared to take notes everywhere, anywhere, because uh, ideas strike at the strangest times, right before you fall asleep, right after you wake up. And if you don't note them down at that point, it's like a dream. You forget about it and, and you lose it. It's kind of... So if you note it down, you have a record of it. And, and that's why I keep, always keep a, a notebook on my nightstall. And I use Evernote on all my devices and, and they synchronize. And you can 
uh, store different types of things in Evernote, even uh, snippets of text, our voice, spo uh, recorded voice. Uh, because when I'm, I'm running and get ideas, or when I'm driving in the car and get ideas, I just record kind of a spoken with my voice recorder. I just record uh, the idea and then just mail it to Evernote, and it's there to consult. And this is also what Steven Johnson, the one from where good ideas come from, calls a spark file, a place where you keep all your half-baked ideas, all the things that you thought about, that this might be a good idea at one point, um, a spark file, you keep all your ideas in one place, but the trick is uh, to actually read through that spark file every three or four months or so. And then all of a sudden connections will pop up or things or you get new ideas just by looking at that and revisiting it. Like that. They might be totally disconnected ideas, but uh, connections will appear. Also, and this is kind of a neat thing I, I found, this is individually when you get ideas, but this is something I found. This is kind of a foldable pocket whiteboard. It's kind of erasable. When you get, when you're in a group of with people and you get ideas, you can start using this as a kind of a, a whiteboard. It was developed by Robin Thomas, a guy, an American guy, who uh, wanted to hitchhike across the United States and he wanted a reusable sign to hold up. So he was thinking about how could I make something that's erasable and still compact and that kind of stuff. So this is called a noteboard. I don't have any stocks uh, in noteboards. It's just uh, a handy thing. So another thing would be, another tip I would give you is work with your circadian rhythm, which is your internal biological clock. And it seems common sense, but I don't see that used, being used too often. Don't schedule very important like meetings uh, when you're only working on one cylinder, when you're not on your best thing. And don't go wasting your peak work time uh, at the doctor's appointment. For instance, the people in Spain, they've, they've known it for a, a while already, their siestas. They, they just catch their uh, least productive kind of time of day and then they come out invigorated after that. So I mentioned before that taking breaks is essential to being productive. But the problem, of course, is that you dump your working stack and you might lose it and you have to, need get, you, you have to get back to work at some point. Right? It's, and it can take a while. And these are two techniques or tips, things that you could do to, to ease, to make it go faster. Uh, priming, for instance, is when you confront, when you're going to take a break, you just identify the next thing you were going to work on, like the next problem you were going to tackle. You just read up on it and then say to yourself, okay, I need to have a solution by the time I get back. You take a break, you don't think about it anymore. And let unconscious processing do the work. And as the study shown, the thing you were working on before, your mind subconsciously is still working on that, even without you noticing. So most often, things will pop up in your mind. Not always the good ideas, but there will be ideas. Um, also, leaving breadcrumbs is a technique that Hansel and Gretel used, and it didn't really work for them, but it can work for you. Uh, it's before you take a break, you dump, kind of dump your working stack, the thing in your head that you're working on, on a paper, a couple of words. Uh, could be on paper or just a text editor and not a novel, just a couple of sentences or a couple of words that j to jog your memory once you get back. I do that usually also at the end of the day. I just note down what I was like when I start up, I see it in front of me, it's, oh, okay, and it all pops back in place. Um, yeah, it kind of works for me that way. So the last thing I would like to mention is uh, test thinking styles and testing. Um, in a blog post, from two years ago, I think, uh, two or three years ago, John Stevenson, a tester from the UK, wrote about critical thinking and creative thinking. And he said critical thinking is, is the, the um, thinking about thinking with the intention of avoiding being fooled, and it's convergent, it's bringing ideas together. And creative thinking is uh, the thinking up of new ideas, and it's kind of divergent, it goes in lots of directions. And he was kind of curious to see which kind of thinking we would use in the different testing activities. And this is the diagram he came up with. You see the, the red parts are critical thinking, the blue parts are creative thinking. And he found, which is not too surprising, that we use both types of thinking in all of our testing efforts. As I say, not too surprising. But I was thinking, in his thinking exercise, uh, he said, okay, some activities are heavy on the critical thinking, while other activities are more heavy on the creative thinking. Critical thinking, for instance, when you're doing reviews, um, of, of some kind that's more like logical thinking, while when you're doing thinking up test ideas, uh, thinking of ways to report a certain 
thinks you're using creative thinking. When you do exploratory testing, you need a good mix of, of both to, to do it well. And the point I would like to make here is, uh, in order to test effectively, you need to be able to switch between critical thinking and creative thinking. You need to be able to consciously make that switch. Um, and I think that managing your focus that way is one of the most important skills in testing. To think critically, we need to be focused. To think creatively, we need to embrace the focus. And this is the final, the final words, the final slide. Focus is in fact a paradox. It has distraction built into it. It's like the two are symbiotic. It's like the yin and yang of our consciousness. But since we cannot really avoid distractions, they're all around us, uh, why don't we harness and try to use the power of distraction uh, to become better and to use it to our advantage? And that's what I started doing in the past years, actually. I tried to, to do it more consciously. And what I'm doing now is uh, I'm looking at the kind of activity when I have to do something, I look at the kind of thinking I would need. And if it's something that involves logical thinking, I make sure I'm... Uh, I'm uh, focused and I'm, I set time boxes and regular breaks. And when I'm uh, doing something creative, I need to do something that involves creative thinking, I make sure I'm distractible and, and, uh, and connected. So also, I started to make more conscious use of unconscious processing. Like the thing you said, uh, ponder a problem, and then instead of diving head first into the problem immediately, just read about it and then just go do something else, something totally different, another, not necessarily something uh, relaxing, or, but another activity even. And subconsciously, you will start working on that problem already. Also, procrastination, and this is the last thing. It used to scare me a lot because it was something that I struggled with when I was studying, but now I know a little bit more about it and it's, it's not scaring me. And I, I use it to get, well, uh, to, to my advantage as well. You know, you can keep postponing things while you get other things done. That's the trick. You need to have that kind of thing. You keep postponing uh, while you can get all the other things done. So that's, uh, that's a bit my talk. And also, for the people, I want to give this away, the noteboard. I want to throw it in the audience. If you promise not to sue me if it hits you in the eyes. Or that way, but to avoid being like a bias, I'm gonna throw it like backwards, like without looking. Is that okay? Yes? Okay, are you ready? <laughs> <coughs> nice catch, thank you. Are there any questions? 